Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Once again, I want to thank you for joining into the program today, and I trust you've been blessed uh, by what we're sharing. Listen, if you've missed any of these programs as we continue to unpack them, this is probably the fifth program we've done on the church at Laodicea. But if you have missed any of these, you can go back to our website at uh, www.lenhouse.com. It's already there on the screen. And everything we have aired to date is on the screen there. Uh, you can go back and watch them at your leisure on demand, and uh, I believe they will be a blessing to you. There's a lot of churches that have asked us if they could run these in their Wednesday night uh, services and share them as part of their teaching. We encourage that. You are welcome to do that uh, because I believe it, it will bless the body of Christ to be able to share these things. Uh, uh, I've been teaching this book again. We're going to come back to the church at Laodicea uh, today. And again, uh, if you've missed some of this and you want to go back and review, you can go back to, uh, uh, like I said, my website also on YouTube, all over at TBN. And TBN has apps also for your smart smartphone and your smart television set. You can simply go to the store, download TBN's app, and you can watch it literally uh, on your television, anywhere you can get an internet signal, or on your iPhone, or on your Samsung device. There are also audio files available where you can listen to us on iTunes as you sign up for our podcast, or you, there is a, uh, a feed also from our website that will stream to your, uh, uh, your, your Samsung devices and some of the other smartphones other than iPhones. So you can get this and carry it with you and listen to it again and again, and we encourage you to do that. Let me get back in the Word uh, today uh, a little bit more because there's so many things I've shared with you already, but I want to dig around a little bit more in this church at Laodicea. Verse 14 says, Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Here's what lukewarmness is, and I want to really capitalize on this a little bit today. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, a white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, nor thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock of him, and hear my voice and open the door. I will come in unto him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then we're going to go into chapter 4 just a little bit. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open. And heaven, the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper, and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Now, uh, some of the things that I dealt with in the last segment is that we talked about moving from the candlestick, because the church was in chapter 1 in the candlestick. And I showed you how that was a picture of the tabernacle of Moses. And so the church was moving from uh, that candlestick, which was in the second dimension of the tabernacle of Moses, which also spoke of the Feast of Pentecost. Or could I say it like this? They were moving from the Pentecostal dimension into the third dimension of the most holy place. I want to I take it from a little bit different uh, perspective in this particular segment and show you some things that I believe the Lord said to me concerning this paradigm shift as well. He said to them, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. Now once again, the powerful thought that we have consistently shared throughout this book of Revelation has been that these seven churches were really seven churches that were in Asia in the first century. John was writing to them so that this letter was directed to them. Every one of these churches, we've already taught this for over 30 weeks, there's something about these seven churches that the paradigm shift that they had to make or the repentance that they had to come to was moving 
from an old covenant mindset to a new covenant mindset. So they're literally moving, uh, you know, from a mentality that says, I'm rich, because they see the, 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 the sense of being lukewarm is being identified here because thou sayest, I'm rich, and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. As I begin to think about that, you know, the Spirit of the Lord began to quicken to me Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is what we commonly call the Beatitudes. Now, a Beatitude is an attitude that you need to be in. Uh, you, sometimes we just need an attitude adjustment. Sometimes we need to have our thinking changed. And see, chapter 3, chapter 4, book of Matthew, John the Baptist and Jesus are teaching, repent. The kingdom's at hand. Revelation 1, 2, and 3 is preaching, repent. Chapter 4, the, the throne room is open. The kingdom is at hand. It's within your grasp. It's there for the changing of the way you think. The moment you repent, you access the kingdom. I tell you, I just get so passionate about this because if we could just get the church to shift from an old covenant mentality to a new covenant mentality, we would begin to operate in the kingdom and see everything that the kingdom has manifest in our lives and in, on this planet. I, I think that's so incredibly powerful. But when Jesus begins to give the Sermon on the Mount, or what we commonly call the Beatitudes. In verse 1, Matthew 5, he said, See the multitudes. He went up into a mountain, and when he was said, his disciples came unto him. He opened his mouth and talked to them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I want to stop for a moment. Because we need to realize that he went up and he saw the multitude and he began to set and teach the gospel of the kingdom. He's saying to them, here's the attitudes that's going to shift you into a kingdom dynamic. You're blessed when you're poor in spirit. Now let me say to you that that doesn't mean to me that we walk around in the molly grubs. It simply means that we recognize that he's teaching a Jewish audience who are still under the old covenant. And he's saying to them, if you don't get a revelation of the spiritual deficit that you are in, you are never going to be able to receive the kingdom. Because he tells them, if you're blessed if you're poor in spirit, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me say to you that he's talking to guys in this fifth chapter, scribes, Pharisees, and religious people who already think they've got it all. They already think, they're, in other words, they have the same attitude of Laodicea. I'm rich and increased in goods. I don't need nothing. They don't, they don't have a sense that says, I'm, 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 I'm hungry for righteousness because these dudes think they're already righteous and they think they're already holy based on their performance. They think that they've already, you know, they think they've already got everything and Jesus is coming to them and saying, you know what? You're blessed. You are blessed, most happy and to be envied if you recognize that the spiritual deficit you're in under this old covenant is the one thing it was void of was the Spirit. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, because once you get hungry for the Spirit of God in your life, He was moving them from a rule-based government under Old Covenant to an indwelling Spirit-led government. Those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. So if you get poor in spirit, He's simply saying to them, if you've got an attitude that says, I'm rich, it's going to be hard for you to enter the kingdom. Jesus said this, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Because as long as you think you got it all, you're neither hot, neither are you cold, you're stuck in the middle. And, and, and God said, that's the ones I'm about to spew out of my mouth. If you don't realize that you got to get hungry for a righteousness that's, that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 5, you'll in no wise enter the kingdom. I'm telling you that when you get hungry for a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, then you're going to be able to be get to move. So when he says to them, uh, you know, if you say you're rich, uh, you know, in other words, if you're rich and increased in goods and don't need nothing, then you're not going to make this shift. If you're satisfied where you're at, and you want to live under that same old stuff that these people did, this old covenant mentality, and you're not willing to repent, what's, you don't even realize. I, I, I got to tell you, I look back at my life, and I, and I look back at the, the life when I was in religion, before I got a revelation of the gospel of grace, and I was wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. Ain't nothing worse than being 
wretched, miserable, poor, and blind don't even know you are, so to speak. In other words, sometimes I don't, I, we didn't realize how bad off we really are. As I go around now and I travel, the places I've been that have embraced the gospel that we've preached, and we see churches growing in, in leaps and bounds, not just number-wise, but spiritually also, because the gospel has absolutely transformed and given them their life back. I got to tell you, I thank God that I'm not in that misery any longer. I, I think about my friends in Trinidad in the West Indies. And when I first went to Trinidad a number of years ago, it was such a massive shift, even on a national level, that those people, every time I go, said, Brother Howes, you saved our lives. And I say, thank you. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. You literally saved our lives. We were, I mean, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But now we're clothed in righteousness. Now we are literally in a place where we're pressing in to the presence of God where we realize now we can sit with him and we can sup with him. Now let me say with that, I want to take you um, uh, to a, uh, a, a parable that Jesus uses in, in Luke's gospel. Uh, Luke, uh, it's Luke chapter number, let me see here, 14, and it's in verse number 16 through 24. This is a powerful parable that Jesus said, and, and, and then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. Now I want you to understand that this is again an invitation to supper. Here's Jesus giving a parable about an invitation to supper. In the church at Laodicea, here's Jesus standing at the door knocking and saying, I want to invite you to supper. I want to invite you to sup with me. And, 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 and me with you, I'm standing at the door knocking. If he man open the door, I will come in and sup with him. Uh, I, I would say to you that this supper, again, is what he's talking about. A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And then he sent his servants at supper time to say them that were bidden come for all things are now ready. Now, I want to tell you who he's talking to again here is a Jewish audience. And he's saying to these scribes, Pharisees, and religious dudes, I'm about to invite you to another supper. I'm about to invite you to a supper that's going to have to do with the new covenant. Now, when I think about the supper, I think about the last supper. When I think about the last supper, it's where Jesus would sit down the night before his decease in that upper room where they were seated, and he would take the bread, and he would say to them, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he would take the cup and say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. And it says, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he gave thanks and he gave it to the disciples. See, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took this bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, take this and eat it because it's my body and it was broken for you. It's what was broken. For, I, he gives it not just to uh, the faithful, he gives it to his betrayers. Let me just say this to you. Everybody at the table is going to betray him before the night's over. The only one going to follow him all the way is John. The rest of them, even Peter said, Lord, I mean, I'll die with you. I'm ready. I mean, I'll fight. I'm, I'm, I'm going to draw my sword. I, I, I got your back. You're, you're, you know, I, I'm with you. But, but Jesus looks at Pete and he says, look, Pete, I know you mean it, son. But before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And so everybody at this table, and then I see him take that sop and say, you're going to deny, you're going to deny me three times. But this is my body, Pete. It was broken for you. It's broken because I know you're going to fail. Because without the indwelling Holy Spirit, you mean well, but you're not going to be able to do it now. But you're going to do it later because Peter stands up after he's full of the Holy Ghost and he begins to preach the famous Pentecostal message, this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he begins to preach with boldness, hallelujah, the things that he could not do before he was filled with the Holy Ghost. But anyway, he's, he's talking here about a supper. Uh, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I'll come in and sup with him. And what we do a lot of times, even with the supper of the communion table, is we make it about disqualifying people rather than qualifying them. Because then we get this thing, we say, well, you know, uh, if you eat and drink this unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to your soul. But the whole context there is that this is my body that was broken for you. So eating it unworthily does not mean you ate it after you sinned, and then you came to the communion table and now, you know, you ate this cracker and you drank this grape juice and now you're, you're, you're eternally damned. That's not what that means. I used to, listen, I used to miss 
even as a leader, I would miss a, 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 a communion service because they made this thing so scary that I thought, you know what, it ain't worth the risk for me losing my eternal salvation over if I take this communion and there's something in my life. Uh, that's not what it's talking about because what it's saying is when you discern, you know, that except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any life in you. In other words, it's what's on the table that made you worthy. So eating and drinking worthily means that you have discerned what the death of Christ and the breaking of his body and the pouring out of his blood was what qualified you and made you worthy so that you can take it in faith and believe and say, you know what, I am accepted and I am worthy to take this supper. That's what this new covenant paradigm shift is about. It's moving from disqualifying and being exclusive to being inclusive. It's about being, instead of rejecting, it's about saying, if you take this and get it in you, you get enough lamb in your belly and enough communion in you, sickness, disease, death, all of that has to leave you. For many are weak and sickly because we don't discern the Lord's body. And even Judas, Judas was the only one at the table that did not discern the Lord's body because he went out after crucifying the Lord and he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? He threw the tip, tip money on the floor of the temple, and he went out and hanged himself. When if he would have waited three hours, the hanging of Jesus would have been his hanging. So when I see him bidding many to the supper here in Luke chapter 14, he made a great supper. This, he's inviting them to this new covenant supper. He's inviting them to this new covenant table, this new covenant feast, if you will. And he bid them to come, for all things are now ready. He's saying to this Jewish audience, i got to give first and then to the Gentile. He said, and they all with one consent begin to make excuse. And the first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs to go see it. I pray thee have me excuse. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excuse. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and note this, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done, and thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out of the highways and hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now I want you to know that he, when he begins to say that, he said he invited, look, he invited this Jewish audience to come to this great supper, this great new covenant table where you're not disqualified. But they begin with one excuse, uh, with, with one consent to make excuse. And I got to thinking about their excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it, and I pray they have me excuse. I, first of all, I would say, who in the world would buy a piece of ground you've never seen before? That's like selling oceanfront property in Arizona. But the truth is, a lot of people have bought into a field that they've never seen. When I think about a field, I think about if I would say to you, what field of work are you in? Uh, what field of ministry? And I think what has happened is so many people have bought into a field of education. And even though they hear God saying, it's time for a change, they're not able to sell that field. And it is that field that they have put themselves into and poured their lives into, or their local churches or their ministries that keep them from being able to make the paradigm shift. The second thing is I bought five yoke of oxen. Again, that speaks to me. Five is the number of fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The ox speaks of ministry because the apostle Paul says, muzzle not the ox that treads in the corn. And so all of a sudden I begin to say, well, here's ministry. This is talking about ministry. This is talking about ministry here. Uh, and they've said, you know what, I bought five yoke of oxen and I need to go prove them. In other words, look, I've proven myself in a ministry and I've built my ministry based on an old covenant paradigm. Not only is this powerfully speaking to me of this Jewish audience was about to be rejected and God was about to take this new covenant kingdom and give it to people on the highways, the byways, and the hedges. He was about to spew these religious leaders and this national state of Israel, this apostate people out of his mouth because they're lukewarm. They won't come in and they won't go out, but he's simply saying to them, you know what? Uh, you're, you're, you, 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 you have got yourself locked in. You've been in 1,500 years of doing ministry the way you do it, and I'm about to shift it, and you can't make the paradigm shift. 
But I see a great, great parallel to the day we're living in when I've sat literally with ministers and men of God and pastors, and they would say to me, I believe what you're preaching, Dr. House, is true. But they realize that if they preach it, I've literally heard them say this, I believe what you're preaching is true, but if we preach this, the people will leave us, and who will pay for these buildings? Well, number one, you've got to decide if you want buildings or you want the truth. But secondly, with the internet and everything else that's out there, people are going to find the truth, whether you hide it, to them or hide it from them or not, they're going to move on. But I don't know about you, but I want to be like Elijah when the Lord called him and Elisha. I want to kill the cow and burn my plow. I want to break my... Listen... I'm, I'm ready to repent. I'm ready. I, look, I, I've come to the place where uh, I, I've got more road behind me than I got in front of me. And I'm telling you that my heart says, whatever I got, if I got to sell out what I have proven uh, myself in this ministry, that, in this second dimension, so to speak, or in this old covenant mentality, I, I think there are people who've gotten famous on a message that has passing off of the seed and they refuse to move on into another dimension as God begins to give revelation. I am so appreciative of some of the guys that I've seen on television recently and even some of our friends that have had the guts to stand up and say to their people, you know what, I preached what I knew to be true then. All of us have been there. But in light of what God is saying now, I've got to move on. I, I think people will honor that. They're not, they're, they're not at all mad because we get up and say, hey, folks, God's given more revelation. Thank God for where we came from. But I'm going to kill my cow and burn my plow because I'm moving in. I'm going to this supper. You can do whatever you want to, but I'm moving to this supper. And I appreciate the men of God that are coming on the scene who had the guts to get up. I had a bishop of a whole organization. He called me. He said, Dr. House, he said, I've been, I did the best I could with what I knew. But he said, you know, in light of what I hear you preach, he said, I believe I taught my people wrong. He said, I'm about to pass off the scene. Would you come down here and help me straighten this mess out before I pass off the scene? And he literally got up in front of his whole conference and he said, look, folks, he said, I did the best I could with what I knew. But in light of what this man is teaching, I cannot die and leave you in this condition. And he, the people stood on their feet for 15 minutes, gave him a standing ovation and literally began to thank him for saying thank you for not leaving us in this uh, dimension simply because you have proven yourself in this dimension. Uh, thank you for not leaving us there. And his church, literally his own personal church, went from 170 to a 1700 seat auditorium before he passed off the scene, but he was able to make that paradigm shift. Can you make the change? Can you come to the temple? Can you come to the suburb? Because I'm telling you, God is about to spit. And when he spits, he's going to spew out of his mouth those who cannot move out of this old covenant mentality into this new covenant. The third one said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. When I think about married a wife, I think about entering into a covenant. In other words, they're saying, I couldn't wait on you, Jesus, to marry you, so I'm in covenant with an old covenant mentality. In other words, in Romans 7, it says, I know you not, brethren, I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which is bound by the law to her husband uh, as long as he lives, but if the husband be dead, she is freed from that law, even though she be married to another man. What the old covenant does is keep you married to the wrong man. It keeps you married to Adam. I don't know about you, but I'm willing to realize that my first husband, Adam, is dead, and I don't have the excuse. I married a wife, therefore I cannot come. This covenant that keeps me bound to a harlot system is no longer going to keep me locked into this old covenant paradigm. And he goes on to say to them, uh, when he'd been out and they said that I have uh, been the servants, and they all begin to make excuses why they could not come. I'll tell you what I think is going to happen, and I see it happening right now, is that God has stepped outside. Even, and I'm not saying that God's not moving in the church, but I just saw in my last tour, uh, especially on the West Coast, man, I saw drug dealers, gang leaders, I saw uh, rival gangs, I saw motorcycle gangs, I saw them all come together in the same venue, guys who were shooting at one another uh, six months ago, over four or five hundred of them at a time, the power of God moving into their lives, and the power of God hit that place, and they were laying on the floors, I mean, uh, criminals and cops together, laying up in a pile as God began to blow through that place and touch them by the power of God. He's inviting folks that have not been invited before. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, God is saying, you know what, it is time to get in or time to get out. You can't play in the middle. You can't mix law and grace. You can't have it both ways. It's time to get in 
or get out because what God is going to do is go into the highways and the hedges and he's going to compel them to come in that his house can be filled. And they said unto him uh, that none of the men that were bidden shall taste of my supper. I believe just like God stepped out of covenant with this old covenant Israel and they literally did not come to his supper, those that were bidden did not taste of his supper But I'm telling you, he's still standing at the door and he's knocking and he's saying to you, if you hear my voice, open the door and come in and I'll sup with you. And he said, but you know what? These men, uh, uh, he said, go and invite them that are halt, that are lame and and that are blind. I I believe that that, that, uh, he's saying to them just like he did in the church at Laodicea. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see, because it is the halt, the lame, and the blind that are entering the kingdom. And Jesus began to uh, invite every one of them uh, to this place because there is a supper that is now ready called a new covenant supper where you're not disqualified, you're qualified. You're not rejected, you're accepted. Where the emphasis is not on what's under the table, the emphasis is on what's on the table. This is my body. It was broken for you. Come to my supper. I'm telling you, man, there's a high calling of God. And when he does, he opens the door and sees the kingdom. He's offering the kingdom here to these folks in Luke chapter 14. But they're about to miss the kingdom. And the kingdom is about to be taken from them and given to a nation that's producing the fruit thereof. Don't miss it. Hallelujah. But open the door and let him come in and sup with you and you with him. We're just about to run out of time again. We're probably going to do one more segment on the church at Laodicea, and I want you to tune back in again uh, next week at the same time. Tell your friends about us. Take a moment to call that number on the screen. If you're enjoying what we're sharing, write to us. Send us an email. Uh, Include a gift if possible. Uh, We're not trying to just get your information so we can barrage you with a bunch of campaigns. But we do like to hear from you, and your gift is what keeps us going and keeps us uh, on the air. Thank you so much for tuning in, sharing with your friends, sharing it on your Facebook page. Call the number on the screen once again, and uh, thank you for tuning in. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ. 